I'm Tobin Heath, two-time World Cup winner. And I'm Kristen Press, two-time World Cup winner. <laughs> and this is The Recap Show. This is the first time we'll be watching the World Cup in over a decade. We know we're not alone with how we feel about the way people talk about women's sports. We want to be part of the solution. Having been there many times before ourselves, Tobin and I are going to bring to you what it's like to play in a World Cup, what's really happening behind the scenes, all the good juicy bits. The Recap Show will bring you gal culture at its finest. We all know what bro culture is, but what is gal culture? We're here to define it. This is our narrative, our culture, and we get to tell it our way. Welcome to The Recap. Welcome to the show. LFG. Welcome to episode seven of The Recap Show. Thank you, as always, for watching and supporting. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe today. Now, let's start with the sports. Two teams remain in their pursuit of making history. And after this next match, a new champion will be crowned. The World Cup Finals are here, and so is the recap show. Today, Kristen and I are joined by the US Women's National Team's young superstar, Alyssa Thompson. But first, Tobin's top things. The foreign coach thing. Amazingly, in the history of both the men's and women's World Cup, the winning teams have always been coached by a citizen of that country. If Serena and England win the World Cup, history will be made. The final 10 minutes thing. Let's face it, most of us should have just woken up for the last 10 minutes of the Spain-Sweden match. And wow, what a last 10 minutes it was. Unfortunately for Kristen, she stayed up for the first 80 minutes of it. The Sam Kerr goal thing. So Sam Kerr had to wait a little while to get her first goal of this tournament. And wow, was it a goal lasso in a semifinal in front of 75,000 of her home crowd. And still, it wasn't enough. It's a cruel summer. The Salma thing. For Spain's Salma Paraguelo, she will be playing in her third consecutive World Cup final. She played in the U17 final, the U20 final, and now the senior team final. She's only 19 years old. Winning is a habit. The 50 subs thing. No, I'm not talking about substitutes, but rather subscribers. I put out there that if we got to 50,000 YouTube subscribers, we would do a bonus episode. Come on, fam, let's go. The sad thing. When you win a World Cup, you get given this badge to wear on your jersey for the next four years that says, we won a World Cup. For the last eight years, the US Women's National Team has worn this badge. And for the first time in eight years, someone else will get to wear it. It's a sad thing. Here we are for the daily discussion. We just finished watching two amazing semifinals, um, some really, really fun stuff. Um, just a couple hours after the second semifinal wrapped, and here we are fresh with our thoughts and opinions. Um, obviously, both games were really exciting. Let's start with Spain-Sweden. Yeah, both semifinals, really entertaining. This is what you want to see in, in semifinal games, some incredible goals. Um, Spain, Sweden was an interesting one because I, I actually thought Sweden was the better team, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. Um, and but I think Spain showed really great character. I mean, the, the way that Spain's playing and in this game, but throughout the tournament, it's like a weird juxtaposition of like beautiful, attractive football, possession-based, but like they're giving everyone a sense that they're not super secure and sturdy, right? Mm -hmm. So in that whole first half, I'm like, oh, Spain's dominating, Spain's a better team. And you're like, no, Sweden is the higher chance yeah. of scoring. They're more efficient. They just felt more secure. Mm -hmm. um, and then somehow Spain pulled it off two well, games in a row. Well, the craziest thing is Spain scored on a cross mm -hmm. and on a set piece beat them at their on own game. a corner and beat yeah. Sweden at their own game. <laughs> yeah. And like, what is that? I that's that's incredible. It, yeah. it was almost shocking. Yeah. When you look at the goals that could have been for Sweden, I thought Rolfo had a couple of, of good opportunities. Um, I thought where Spain became super dangerous was when Alexi actually came out of the game and they inserted Salman to the game and it gave them a completely different dimension. Um, it gave them a big energy boost, and it was the perfect time 
um, for that moment to happen. And you started to see all of a sudden Spain start to get some opportunities and create chances. And if you um, had, if I had to put my finger on like why Spain won the game, I really don't know. Like, I don't exactly know, but I think what you're saying is, like, great mentality, uh, great resilience, come back. Now going into the final, and you've you've had Alexia start in your semifinal. Um, she yeah. comes off. The team actually gets better, goes on to win the game. What do you do? I think these games, it's, it's almost like we're, like, watching the NBA. You only want to turn it on in the fourth quarter. <laughs> um, but I think these games, like... It's really interesting when it's when these games are being decided, and it's showing that the game needs something extra at the end. So whether you're holding back, you know, a, a big player, or a big moment, it, it seems like that's that's what is strategy. happening. Yeah. Um, but but for me, it's an interesting predicament. Look, he's gone with a couple. Like we questioned whether he was going to go with Gonzalez or Hermosa up top. He went with Hermosa up on up top, which get, put Alexia back in into the starting eleven. Um, I don't think she was particularly good, uh, but this is a player that you would want on the field, right? For I think sure. they give. There's the, these players with a presence that you just respect, right? Mm -hmm. Two-time Ballon d'Or winner, you just you just respect. But I don't think she's playing at that level. But it's hard to not have her on the field. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if bringing her into the game later would have given them the bump. So I think starting with her, it kind of stabilizes them. Uh, and you also was think great. And Jenny's playing. Jenny's playing. Our Janita. Let's talk Australia, England. Yes. Okay. So this game is kind of fresh on our, our minds from last night. Wow. Again. An incredible semifinal. Um, so fun to watch. So fun to watch. I thought in the first off, England just so in control of the match. Mm -hmm. You know, especially first half, so in control, um, really stable, very confident, uh, very tidy. I would say Australia, different look. I mean, Sam in the starting lineup, it did not gel. The first half, what I would say is they were forcing it to mm -hmm. Sam, right? You saw them being very direct. Um, it had a different look to it, and I thought it was very forced and a little awkward. I thought halftime happened. I felt like they regrouped. They came out in the second half, looked much more organized and cleaner in the way that they were going to attack. Um, I will say the the goals in this game were fantastic. Ella Toon has, is a Big game player, <laughs> big game player. That Beautiful. goal, fantastic. Um, I love that moment for her, and and you got the sense that they weren't they weren't done. They knew that wasn't going to be enough. That's what it looked like. The way they were playing, they were not they were not content with that. They were um, they were apprehensive about the way that Australia can turn a game, especially with the crowd. I mean, when when Australia scored, what a moment for Sam Kerr. That goal, so that goal is is a World Cup goal. It's like you can't fabricate it. Like the energy in that stadium, her being kind of held back with her injury in the tournament, and then having that moment. In, well, in let's my talk about in, it. Let's in, talk about it. Yeah, so but in, in that a couple moment, of things that I think are like really interesting. Like the first one is, you're pointing out like they've played this tournament without Sam, right? And so they built an identity and they got in a yeah. form without one of the world's best players their best player and like in, in a home world's cup, right? With the emotional baggage of having that player on the bench, right? And it was a little disruptive because you can't really have Sam on the field and not play to Sam, right? Because yeah, she's yeah. that good. Yeah. So it was like, that was like an interesting thing. Then they get it right. They get it going. They find a groove. Sam scores a freaking Worldy. golasso, like such a good goal. Not your typical Sam Kerr money in the not bank goal. All. Like not a, at all. A goal where you rise up above everything and yeah. you're just like destined to score. But then she had a couple of chances that are like, those are the money in the bank Sam Kerr goals. Yeah, yeah. That you just like, she, like the one where she headed it over the bar. The header and the, and then the volley that dropped down to her. Yeah, those two. And that's game, those are game winning goals. Yeah, it's kind of like you'd rather have not had the worldie and had the two typical Sam, Sam Kerr goals, like the reason why she's in there. I don't know how the host country equalize on a worldie and don't go on to find the next the next goal yeah. to win that game. What yeah. does that say about England, though, to concede a goal like that 
to have that whole energy in the stadium be against you and to be able to not only ride that like that wave like be able to you know take that energy and not only like absorb it but then come back and score mm -hmm. two goals and finish the game yep and that steadiness that i've been looking for with england when i watch them i'm looking for that like confidence that steadiness that european champion we it it showed in that second half like yeah. the way that they came back and scored was just like it made it look easy. Yeah. They made it look like no problem. We were always going to score, and they just rode that yeah. emotional roller coaster in a very, very professional way. And and, and Laura, Lauren Hemp, fantastic performance. I think she's had a fantastic tournament, um, and she did that extra thing that I always think is just like would be next level for her as a player. Which you know she gets a goal and an assist, and you know her assist to to Les was beautiful. No look. Fake shot, yep. perfect final pass. I mean, those those are really beautiful goals. Um, yep. So and now I mean, it's the final. It's anybody's game. Honestly, any of those four teams, even based on their performances, could have made it into yeah. the final. And would have had great. great and these are the two teams that have made it. And, um, and we love a lot of players on both those teams. We have a <laughs> lot of players we love on both those teams. It's very true. As a professional soccer player, it's crucial that I stay hydrated and drink electrolytes. Well, I recently tried Element and loved the way it tasted and how it made me feel. Element is an electrolyte drink mix and you don't need to be a pro athlete to enjoy it. You can mix it in a cocktail, you can mix it to cure a hangover, you can mix it after being active or even while traveling. Basically, whenever you need a salty electrolyte boost, you need Element. I've been staying up late watching the World Cup and drinking a ton of Element recently. And honestly, it's made me feel a lot better. And right now, Element is offering a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serve packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share a packet of Element with a friend. Get yours today at drinkelement.com recap. And remember, this deal is only available through my link. So go to D-R-I-N-K lmnt.com slash recap. And the best part is, Element offers a no question asked refund. Try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, share it with a friend and Element will give you your money back. You have nothing to lose and electrolytes to gain. Big thanks to Element, now back to the show. Well, while we were here filming uh, the recap show episode seven, news broke that Vladko might be resigning and we don't know if that is true or if it um, has any merit, but uh, we thought we would take an opportunity to say, if, if that is true, um, what would you like to see, Tobin, from the next coach, the next leader of the U.S. Women's National Team? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a strong signal. I think it's one that, that we all expected uh, because that result was not up to the standards of the U.S. Women's National Team. Um, and now we look forward, right? Uh, I think there's a couple things, and we can we can work through them. But the first thing is we have a quick turnaround to to the Olympics. Um, you're gonna need a short-term lens the way you're looking at mm -hmm. this. We want to win the Olympics. We need to put ourselves back on track, back in the category that we want to be in. Um, and then we have a long-term focus, right, towards the next World Cup. Um, in the short term, I think the number one thing is player identification. I think we need a leader that has a keen eye and understanding of what's required of an international player. Okay. What does that mean? What, what is required of an international player? What it means is you're picking from a player pool, particularly a player pool that primarily plays in the U.S., in a certain style, in certain systems, in a very American um, style. That is not translated to international football necessarily. So you need somebody, a leader with a keen understanding of the system that is going to be played, how to implement the system, and which players are best for the system. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean who are the best players, mm -hmm. who's scoring the most goals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who's everyone talking about. It's not that at all. Yeah. You might as well just close your eyes and you might as well <laughs> think to yourself, what is required for the U.S. Women's National Team to be successful? What is that player profile? 
Then you identify that player. You have to see it. You have to feel it. And then you have to see how each one of those pieces is going to integrate with the other piece. So I love that. I think the point you're making is it's not always the best players. It's the right players. And that's yes. player identification as a key part of a short-term strategy to turn this team around um, for yes. the Olympics coming up. Let's talk about, uh, you, you always talk about super factors. Um, and what those are and what how, how does the coach um, identify those and uh, make sure that the team has what they need to win when it comes to the short-term strategy. What has made the U.S. Women's Nash team successful is a clear identity and understanding of what is the team going to do to win the World Cup. And we could have said those if you asked what 2015 super factors are, what 2019 super factors are. We know those because they were taught to us over and over again. And the way that we practice was towards those super factors. So what you're saying is you want a coach that's going to come in and identify the super factors for the group and team that is ahead. Not that the super factors are always the same. Yes. Identify them and then build a team to be successful with them. Yes, I mean, there are clear super factors that you have to, you don't want to take away the best pieces of what the US Women's Nash team are. So uh, somebody with an understanding of, we talk about the DNA of a Nash team player. It, it's, it's very clear DNA. You don't want to just scrap the whole thing. You take those pieces. Um, Give an example of what one US Women's National Team super factor is. Um, being, mentally and physically strong. I mean, I think we're a country that relies heavily on our athleticism, on our physicality. That should be like at the bedrock of what we do, and I think it should only get better, better, better. Great. There's no reason to ever settle for where we are in that. I think we can always get better physically. And then another super factor could be like set pieces if we have the organizationally, right Organizationally, I think organizationally is a super factor for us. Our set pieces have always been top. We've always had players that have either been great servers of the ball, great at finishing within the box, um, and on the flip side of that, really hard to score on mm -hmm. and set pieces. And at an international level, that's non-negotiable. Love that. Okay, so we have talked about player identification. We've talked about super factors. What about culture? What about the way that a coach makes you feel? I feel like when it, when we're talking about a tight turnaround, the most important thing is buy-in, player mm -hmm. buy-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I want to see a coach that not only do these players believe in them, respect them, but they want to fight for them. You can tell coaches that players want to play for and it could be for a variety of reasons you know we we take England right now Serena like the the players say she's a mastermind you know like that's one word that can be used for a coach right um you look at playing for Tony Tony is just like he he's a teacher he teaches and and actually for this group of players when I think of what's important because there are so many young players and so many players that have not been at this level and have not had this responsibility I do think you need a teacher you need somebody that is not developing with the players that's where where we, we cannot have somebody that is learning at the same time that the players are learning um, and and we need somebody that I think is a proven winner. You have the best team in the world. There is no excuses to not go out and get the best coach in the world or the best fit for what we think the U.S. Women's National Team needs. Love that. Okay, so I mean that is a tough job. You're coming in, you've less than 12 months, um, so you've identified some things that you want to see from the coach in order for short-term success. I think that this is the hardest job in the world. It's a hard job, right? But then you talk about the long-term strategy yes. and what's needed to make sure that this program stays at the top for the next decade, for the next generation Yeah, of we talk about the bedrock that you're building on. You're building on the best mentality in the world, mm -hmm. literally the best mentality in the world. You're building on the bedrock of the best athletes, the best physicality in the world. Now, we, we heard Jill talk about you know, when she picked out Rose, when she picked out Mal, and she said, that's the next evolution of this team. She picked them out at a young age, and she brought them into the fold, and she developed them into the system, slowly developed them into the system. That's what's needed. It, it, you can't just wipe okay. it out and bring We're something We're talking new. about player development now. Player development, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. And that's, that's having a key eye to what's going to be needed. So it's like you, you ask, what's needed to win the Olympics? What do I need to do this in this next year. Then you zoom out and you say, what is needed from a developmental perspective to win the World Cup? And those two answers are gonna be different. 
The near and the long are different, mm -hmm. but they have similar kind of flavors. And in order to be able to answer one of those two things, like you still have to have an understanding mm -hmm. and an identity of what you're doing. And an example of that, in my opinion, is in when it comes to like the Olympic player selection, having one eye on players that might not be able to play a big role at the Olympics, but they might be playing a big role in the World Cup. Yes, I mean, you make a great, great point. I mean, in the, the Tokyo Olympics, 2020, 2021, whenever that was, <laughs> I was- that every time. Yeah, about I, I, I know, it's like such a weird time. <laughs> still upset about still it. Still upset about it, yeah, because I think you bring up a good point. I was disappointed in the player selection during that world championship because in my in my opinion, I'll take one specific example. There's no reason why Sophia Smith's first world championship was this World Cup. Why didn't she come to the Olympics? When she was not only to be the best. And and then she was expected to be one of our best players. That is not the US women's national team. That's when you know the transition has not been done well. There were a couple indications. Sophia Smith, that should not be her first world championship. We should never rely on somebody going into their first world championship to be the best player on the U.S. Women's National Team, to be the one that's going to score all the goals. That's a bad transition. Second, we should never have a player coming in with one cap starting the first two games of our World Cup. And that's no offense to that player. That's a bad transition. And for me, th there's a process and, and there's a building process. And, and we miss that boat. And, and there are consequences to missing that, that process. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a good handoff between the veterans and the younger players because there was all of a sudden this division between veterans and younger players when actually that should be a beautiful marriage. Mm -hmm. There's nothing better on the national team than giving like then opening the door for the next generation. What I love about what you're saying is actually like unique. Like not every country has this ability to mentor and pass down the torch. But the reason that we do is especially right now, the veteran players are, you know, two-time World Cup winners. Yeah. So there's a unique X factor that we have mm -hmm. that if utilized properly, it's a torch passing that should prepare young players to uh, you know, be the the best again, and I think for you, especially having been so young on the team, like you had that experience, yep. um, but maybe you haven't had it in that same way as a veteran um, when you would have been, you know, playing with Sophia Smith on the national team, yeah. taking reps side by side with her. Joy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is experience yep. and also kind of the the resume that you want to see, kind of like the standard of like, this is, we should go for no less. Yeah, I think international experience is key for this job um, for a couple of reasons. For the identifying factor, identifying what, what an international style player is required of them, um, but also from internationally being able to understand what camps like, what FIFA windows are like. It's very different than club football. Mm -hmm. You're given a short period of time, we're talking about one, two weeks, that you have to utilize every second of it towards a very specific goal. And if you aren't laser focused in that process, you're missing the mark. Mm -hmm. And every single day, you're shaving down time. I, I can remember our preparation where our fields were set up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because if we missed a minute or if we didn't get one rep, that was one thing that took away from us winning a World Cup. Mm -hmm. That's the precision that is needed in this process, especially when we talk about looking forward to uh, Olympics next year. The precision has to be immaculate. And that comes first and foremost with player identification and group identification and identity of this team. How is this team going to not give up goals? How is this team going to score goals? How is this team going to dominate games? Who are the players? Who are the subgroups? Who are the relationships? Who are the leaders? Having such a laser focus. Yes, can you bring in more players to figure it out? Yes. Are there already players that have checked those boxes? Yes. But there are too many players right now that have been brought to this World Cup that haven't even checked a box. They had a whole World Cup and they haven't checked a box. Okay, so. so you need a coach that has an understanding of the international game, has a respect for the international game, and knows how to operate in international FIFA calendar windows in order to perform. 
Love it. I think that, you know, obviously there's a lot of noise um, from the World Cup and from the U.S.'s um, performance. And um, I think one thing that we have talked about is, you know, people are saying like, I'll be the savior. I can do it. But the truth is we don't need a savior. We need a strategy. Okay. And um, who said that? You said a that. wise person yeah, said yeah. that. I was trying to get you to say it the whole time, but we I just... don't need we don't need a savior. We don't it's need a, a good savior. Line. We need a strategy. It's a great line. I think it deserves to be in the show. Hi everyone. We've been overwhelmed and overjoyed by all of your support of the recap show. When Tobin and I sat down and began discussing building a media division for our business with the mission to reimagine the way women are seen and experienced in sports we couldn't have imagined how much fun this would be. To say thank you to the hundreds of thousands of you watching, listening, and supporting this show, we are offering you a special discount to shop our World Cup inspired collection. 20% off the Ridden in the Stars collection with code Ridden in the Stars 20. At Re Inc, intentionality and integrity are at the heart of all that we do. Each piece of our gender free clothing line has been thoughtfully made in the US at a women owned factory with 100% organic cotton. So head to re website.com and use code Ridden in the Stars 20 for 20% off our World Cup inspired collection. Thanks for all the continued support. Now let's get back to the show. As promised, we're here with the one and only Alyssa Thompson. Woo! Welcome to the recap. So let me uh, share some of your amazing accomplishments with the world. <laughs> Alyssa Paola Thompson is a young superstar for the U.S. Women's National Team and for Angel City FC. When she was 15, she committed to play at Stanford, but later opted out to go pro instead. In 2021, she was named Gatorade National Soccer Player of the Year. Alyssa would go on to be the number one NWSL draft pick in 2023. While still in high school, Alyssa scored five minutes into her pro <laughs> debut with Angel City, and if I remember correctly, it was a good one. <laughs> and in her first regular season match with Angel City, she scored in the first 11 minutes. So oh. you are starting your games hot. Um, <laughs> she would go on to win NWSL Rookie of the Month uh, for March and April of this year. This June, Alyssa was named to the U.S. Women's National Team. She was the youngest player on the World Cup squad, and she appeared in her first ever World Cup. Um, she made her de debut against Vietnam in a 3-0 opening round win. We expect incredible things from her in the next few years to come, and we are thrilled that she is joining us today. Welcome, Alyssa. Woo! Thanks. That made me blush, guys. Oh, good. <laughs> then we're doing our job well. That was like a long, a long thing. <laughs> but it's a big deal having you here. We have been here this whole World Cup, sitting on this couch, talking about the World Cup, um, and you were, you were over there playing in it, and um, we, we were so proud. Obviously, you being my teammate at Angel City, uh, you represented us so well. And we're so proud, and it was such a big job. So proud. And um, can I brag on Alyssa since you yeah. just gave her a bio? I want to give you an unofficial bio. This is in the words of Tobin. Okay. <laughs> um, Alyssa Thompson, um, the little magician. <laughs> I'm a fan. Uh, I remember the first time watching you play. I watched you play for the U-20s, very special. And then I got to watch you play here in the backyard of LA. And you have a incredible, innate way of playing that I have rarely seen in a player. It's just in you. You just, just instinctively know the game and how to be special. I can't wait to watch the rest of your career because already you're doing things that wow me um, and are going to absolutely wow the world. And now you have a World Cup under your belt at 18 years old. Um, it's really cool. Let's talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about it. Okay, and one other thing. So, <laughs> okay. Tobin and I were fighting, like bickering the other day. Fighting. And she was like, you never know when anyone's going to be a good player. Name one player that you saw play you thought she was always... good. And I was like, Alyssa, I saw and it I in said fair. five minutes. I was like, oh, she's really good. Because you also had a lot of hype, right? So then sometimes we watch with a more critical eye when yeah. a player's supposed to be good. And within five minutes, I was I like. a very critical eye. I was like, dang, the hype's real. <laughs> this is real. Yeah. Um, okay, but to go to the World Cup. I would like to hear, how did you pass your time? What did you do for fun? We know oh that, gosh. you know, soccer <laughs> takes up a little slice of the day. 
What yeah. did you do in between training and meetings? Um, sometimes I would watch a, my show on Netflix. What's it's SWAT? What's, SWAT? Yeah. Ooh, never, never heard heard of it. It. Yeah, it's so it's so good. I love watching like police things, oh, like, and it's oh, based in LA. <laughs> It's so interesting, like how they figure out things and investigate, and then it's based in LA, so I like I know some of the places they're at, so it's cool. Okay. But, yeah. So and you were then, all the way so over in New Zealand and Australia watching <laughs> LA police shows. Yeah. Got it. You were okay. really homesick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about um, what your World Cup experience was like, what it felt like preparing, um, and how how that tournament felt for for you being there for your first time. Yeah, I mean, I was very, like, nervous in preparation for the World Cup because I didn't know if I was going to get called in or, like, if I was doing enough or if I was, like, I don't know. I f you was had, very scared. You had a really abrupt call in. Oh, yeah. We were talking about this. It was crazy. So, Mal Pugh, this was, like, the April camp. So, this was the kind of, like, the camp before, basically, the send-off games and then you go to the World mm -hmm. Cup. Mal Pugh, in the first game of a two-game camp, goes down with an injury that everybody's like, it's going to be bad. It's going to yeah. be bad. We're going to need to replace her on the World Cup roster. You literally get a phone call <laughs> during the game. Yeah. While the game's still going yeah. on. Yeah. During the game. Like the 90 minutes of the game that Mal goes down in. She and you get on a plane. You then start yeah. in that match. I'm Two pretty sure later. you got calf cramp. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I, and I was like... Good God, I know she's 18, but this is a lot. <laughs> you get a calf grip. <laughs> you played great. Uh, because then you started then the next game, the send-off game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you went to the World Cup. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. It, I was just like, for the first camp, I was walking in like, okay, I, I, I don't know what he's going to do because, like, Miles hurt. I, I don't know... They already had a lot of players for the game. Like, I didn't even know if I was getting called in. I, was, I wasn't watching the game because we just finished practice. So I was like, <laughs> what is going on? And I was, like, so nervous. Oh, my gosh, nervous. wait. During the game, you were practicing, so you don't even know what's happening. Yeah. And then you're, like, in the locker room and you get a phone call. Yeah, we were playing at Pepperdine, and I was at the Malibu Country Mart after. <laughs> Kate calls me. Her life. reception's terrible. She's like, I'm at the stadium. Wait, let me text you. And then she texts me, like, your flight number. are you able to get on a flight tonight to go to wherever? Um, to but that is, like, a very fast turnaround. Yeah. And then from that point, you had a few months to prepare. <laughs> yeah. And you, every time I ask you, like, how you're doing before a game, you tell me every time, like, oh, I'm really nervous. Yeah. But then when you go out, you play, like, with no nerves at yeah. all. You play like you've been there a million times. So you were feeling a little nervous, but that's kind of your homeostasis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Very> great. <laughs> Terrified, but great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was nervous. But also, I was like, before I got called in to, like, that April camp, I wasn't even, I didn't think that, I I was, like, trying to do everything that I could to be on the team, but yeah. I didn't think I had, like, a really high chance of being able to make it. And that after that, that kind of, like, okay, if I continue to do what I do on the field, then maybe I'll be able to get called in. So I feel like that was a little, like, after that camp, I was like, okay, I have to really yeah. like, get ready. Was that your your mentality, like, just for you? Because we went out to dinner, like, not long before that, yeah. I remember. And you were in the conversation, right, for, for making the World Cup team. And I remember I told you, just keep playing awesome. That's all <laughs> you have to do. Like, you were already playing awesome, keep playing awesome. But was that a mentality that you had or was that something that was told to you? Like, if you just keep playing the way you're doing or if you play well in the league – you could make the World Cup team? Or was it just kind of something that you were telling yourself? Well, I mean, Vlako said that, like, and he's told us, like, the whole team that, like, if you do well in the league, like, after that camp, he was like, it's not just based on what you do in camp. It's, like, what you do in the league, too. Mm -hmm. And then also I was just like, you can't, if you look at how I play, you can't, like, not see, like, that I could help maybe the team in yeah. some way. So, like, that in the league, that's the way he could see me play. So yeah. that's what I was like. If I play good, then there's no really. Yeah. Like, like you, yeah. yeah. And and with that, like with the abrupt kind of shift as you're going through your season from, okay, I'm going to do everything I can, but there doesn't seem like a high probability I'm going to the World Cup this summer. 
to, oh my gosh, I'm in the running and I'm like starting and there's a role, a starting role that's open, right? Um, did you feel that in that shift in those couple of months that you were prepared when you got to the World Cup? Yeah, I think I was prepared. I think that going to the world, I am, well, I just, again, I get nervous. So I think that was like the only thing that is prob probably like brought me down a little bit. But I think that I was ready like physically for it and um, like I wanted to play. So mm -hmm. I was like ready. Mm -hmm. We we heard a story recently that you, I feel like part of your your journey is like you kind of have manifested, you know, being on the Nash team, making the Nash team. You've gone through the ranks of the Nash team. You come from like a very soccer focused family. So it's very much a part of like your path, right? You're like, this is just the next step on my path. I go yeah. pro, I make the Nash team, I win World Cups, I'm the best player in the world. Like this is Alyssa Thompson. Um, but we heard a, a funny story recently that you and your sister who also plays, she's a little bit younger than you, um, that you guys took the U15. No, the 2015. Tw sorry, U15. 2015 World Cup poster and you put your faces on. <laughs> so Kristen and I were wondering, <laughs> whose faces did you <laughs> cover? Cover. Okay, <laughs> where they are. I think, I think it was funny because <laughs> I don't really remember, but I think there's a picture and I think my face was like on like Becky or Julie or something. <laughs> Correct so answer. it didn't like, I, it didn't make any sense to me. You're like, this is not a well balanced team. <laughs> I was just like, I don't I don't think we even had like an idea. We were just like, okay, let's, let's put our faces on it. But yeah, it was like in our room, right next to like our beds. It was yeah. so funny. Yeah. yeah, I get that idea of like kind of the manifestation of the dream because I very much. Um, actually, unlike you, I think you both share a similarity in kind of the styles of your families that you grew mm. up in. Yeah, we were thinking about you and you seem like you have a super close relationship with your family and they're playing like a major part in um, your career and your life. And I have a similar feeling with my family where uh, both my sisters played, I played on their teams, both my parents managed and coached, <laughs> both my parents really wanted me to play for the national team. Um, and it's really funny because actually with Tobin, we look and we go, we got to the same place, but we got there from like the most opposite ways yeah. in terms of the role that our family played. Um, her family was super hands off. So she just was, they were just like, go to practice, whatever. My parents <laughs> were like, like showing me videos, being like, you gotta go train. I'll pay you $20 if you can kick it over this fence. Like they were like pushing. So tell us what, what was your, what is your family's role? What, what was it when you were growing up? Um, and what is it like now? Yeah, I think it's kind of similar to that. Just like me and my sister were like a year apart. So we just could train together. And I feel That's like awesome. um, that was really fun because I was able to just get better that way. And like my mom is more hands off, I feel like. And my dad's <laughs> like, he he was like training us. He never played soccer. He would watch like <laughs> messy videos and then That's put, so drills, gosh, yeah. put drills in my the- My mom yeah. watched the Pele videos. Pele videos. <laughs> this is so great. Yeah. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Yeah. And like we would go in the backyard, he would just like set up drills, we would do them. <laughs> we were not good at all when we were little and we were just like fast and um, we played a bunch of different sports so we weren't just like focused on soccer. We did like basketball, volleyball, gymnastics, like we did it all. And then like once I think my dad realized we were like good at it, <laughs> he like started pushing us more and like we were playing on different teams and stuff like that. But it was definitely a lot like to do with my sister because I couldn't have like because we went to a boys team and mm -hmm. I could not have done that without her I oh, think wow. because she I would feel so lonely <laughs> and she's like my comfort so being there being able to feel like I could be myself like playing was good because I would I have someone that that's like me there and I know her so <laughs> yeah yeah that's what was awesome. it like so did you play on a boys team that was like what the same age no well no they weren't the same age I, I was playing with my age group she was playing with her age group and then we would we had the same coach though so we mm -hmm. would practice a lot together and like before practice was like probably the worst part when she wasn't there because like I would be by myself and I feel <laughs> like that like I rely on her so much like like just to do passing or talk or something. I mean, if I was there alone, I would not talk to anyone, so. I mean, yeah. that's like, we were actually just talking about being we, like. Spaces, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, that like what a, like an amazing thing that you did that one, you're like, you know, training, getting good training, getting co competitive um, in that way, like playing with 
boys, but also that like you have to do that is kind of like there's something like like wrong yeah. with the structure. And then it's also you have to like go over this like social hurdle yeah. where especially like boys don't always respect girls who play. <laughs> so like having to deal with that um, and like I think it is like really special that you had your sister, but like how did you kind of do that? Did you feel like boys like respected you as a player like once you started playing? Yeah, I think – they respect like when I was little I played with the same team and I was like not good I was like on the B team I don't think they liked me because I was bad <laughs> like I, I I was just there like for fun I guess but, wait like, why what what was the decision to play on a boys team um, at so, such a young age I think my dad our dad just took us there one time and the coach like oh asked yeah us to be okay on the team so we were we just played for a little bit and then I went back to girls and it was like a lot of fun. I was like, pl but I was playing up like four years. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then my dad was like, okay, we could like during COVID, he's like, we should go back to the boys team just to train. Mm -hmm. And then the coach asked us to be on the team again. So we knew some of the boys, but I think that like they respected us a lot more. And like, once we started playing, they like, they knew that we were good enough to be on the team. So they weren't like, weird about anything or, yeah. yeah but I mean that's like a that's like kind of a a cool thing like for your confidence and your development that you had to like overcome that I also love mm -hmm. that you like were in the environment and then you like left and then you came back and you're like now I'm good <laughs> yeah. so yeah. Like, passing the ball um that's really I, cool and I did share with you I think that you are an anomaly on the national team because there was this like fun stat that firstborn children don't exist on the national team that it's actually like quite research research ex like research. extensively by Toby. yes yes <laughs> very interested in these trends you know so what i i remember when we went out to dinner i i was like no way you're the oldest and you're like yeah and i was like you're really going up against like a lot of a lot of research a lot of data a lot of research <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and um but i do think what what you reference about your sister being so close in age there is other research where we have a lot of twins on the national team yeah mm -hmm. so i do think you're playing into a dynamic more closely related to that where mm -hmm. you had a training partner and you did reference in covid actually when a lot of people kind of didn't have training environments because there wasn't any you know teams up and running mm -hmm. you still had your sister to train with yeah and that i think is like a big gave you like a a time where most people stopped developing for a little bit yeah. it gave you a time where you could continue to develop yeah it was really nice honestly yeah I just like had my sister and, so. and then you decided to make the brave decision I don't know if brave is the right word but the decision to um not go to Stanford um and to go pro what was that decision like for you it was very hard like we my, me and my family thought about it for a long time and then ultimately it came down to my decision but it was just like there were so many factors that went into making it and I thought like this is kind of my dream job and yeah. I have the opportunity to do it right now and going to college there's a lot of factors that I don't know about too like am I going to get better am I going to like Continue you to can't play on the boys team. Yeah. <laughs> I can't play on the boys team. Um, and like, I just don't, I, there were a lot of factors like there too. So ultimately like right now I was like, I want to pursue like my dream job. And yeah. if I have the opportunity right now to do that and in LA and like, just like yeah. having it in LA was that's a big part. factor. Yeah. I yeah. don't, I wouldn't have gone if it wasn't in LA. Yeah. So oh, being able to like be close to home, still go to my high school. Um, yeah. Still be with my friends. Um, that was really nice. All right. So now we are going to take a break and recover for a bit. And there's no better way to recover than with our friends at UFOS. And we're going to take some of our community questions. You ready, Kristen? Ready. Okay, Holly asks, does pineapple belong on pizza? That's a hard no. Really? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't like sweet and savory. You know that. I like savory, period. And then later, I like sweet. <laughs> Fair. Period. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Carolyn from Cleveland asks, if there was one soccer rule you could change, what would it be? 
Um, I'm going to go with the role that is probably changing from my, my guy Arson, um, which is the offside role. I think being more favorable towards the attacker, um, which is the way that I think the rule is about to change, and we'll see a lot more goals. Oh, that, I do not want that to change. And I'm someone who is barely offside often. Mm -hmm. I feel like you learn the line. You, like, train the line. And now your entire training of how to stay onside is going to be different. Mm. Like, because it's, like, based a lot and you're like, yes, whatever, would, I don't want to go into it. It would <laughs> change a lot. If there was another rule I would change, it would be um, to eliminate the flip throw. I find there to be <laughs> nothing less cool in football than a flip throw. Okay, perfect. Next. <laughs> okay. Karen from Toronto asks, would you rather be chronically underdressed or overdressed? I feel like I don't have to answer this question because it's a pointed <laughs> question. <laughs> um, it's a pretty obvious question. <laughs> so I'm going to just answer with a look. <laughs> okay. Oh, Karen from Pennsylvania asks, we've heard you're a whistling enthusiast. What is your favorite song to whistle, and can we hear it? Oh, wow. Um, I don't have a favorite song. I'm always whistling. I guess we could do... Thank you all so much for submitting your questions. If you want to submit a question, you can join our Re-Ink membership. And if your question gets on the show, we're going to send you a pair of UFOs. So keep those questions coming. Let's go back to the World Cup. Um, <laughs> because I do think that everybody has a different experience at the World Cup. Um, we were talking a little bit about this. Um, and, you know, each, even, you know, Tobin and I have done several and like each one's a little bit different and i yeah. think that there's this idea from the outside world especially when you've won um that like it should have been super fun right uh but every world cup's different and obviously this was a tough one for the team mm -hmm. um but there's a lot of good things in your experience too being your first opportunity mm -hmm. and getting to learn and getting to see that team so i would just like to know how the world cup felt for you it felt like in the beginning, it didn't really feel real to me still because I was just, I felt like, oh, well, I was new on the team. I've never done this before. Like people were still trying to like, I feel like get me like up to speed a little bit. And then for a while, like you, throughout the tournament, I was just like, there were some days where I was just like sad mm -hmm. and like, I don't know. I, I felt really lonely some days too. It was just. I feel like it's a lot, that tournament, and, like, playing or not, like, there's different things, too, and I wasn't, I wasn't playing that much, so, like, also having that, and, like, I, I felt like I was, like, happy for game day. I wasn't as yeah. nervous as most people, and I was, like, more, like, excited. I felt a lot like a fan mm -hmm. watching the games and stuff, and I was obviously ready to go in whenever I needed to go in, but it was, like, it just felt like a different experience and it's going to be different for everyone on the team too, mm -hmm. which is weird too, because mm -hmm. every world cup's different, but it's different for everyone too. Yeah, exactly. And like, I think back on my 2015 experience, actually, I went into that tournament as a starting player and it was my first world cup. And I had this like clear vision of how this was going to go, <laughs> right? And, um, the third game of the group, I did not start. And I, I, I don't think I started the rest of the tournament. Um, and so I was managing the team winning. And actually, the first two games we played terrible. <laughs> I don't think I was that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the team really did not perform well. And then I was no longer playing. And then the team started like winning, right? And so I was dealing with the tension of not meeting my own expectation and then the team winning. And mm -hmm. so that's where I think it gets really interesting because like at the end of the tournament, everyone was like, Kristen, World Cup champ. Yeah. And I was like, I honestly was, I cried through the most of that tournament, you know, because like no matter how selfless you are in a tournament, like you do have expectations for yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, we were even talking about your 2019, which is a completely different experience because you're playing great, the team's winning, you're playing every minute, 
and you have stories where you were not having a good time. Do you want to talk about that? Well, no, I mean, it was... <laughs> no, you don't want to share your feelings with the world? Because I want to. <laughs> well, I'll just say I, I don't cry that often. And I remember, and this is like kind of a testament to just the kind of amount of, I would say, like pressure and expectation of the moment. And I remember one game that we had played, we then had like a... Spain. It was Round against 16. Spain, you're right. I remember so well. Round of 16. She and we had. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> we had um, a meeting after um, where we were going over like what we could do better. And I remember like one of my jobs and one of all of the Forge jobs in that particular World Cup was to really aggressively make runs and push, push the line to create space. And um, a lot of it was like selfless work, like running knowing that you're not going to get the ball. And I remember in that particular game, I did like a lot of selfless running. And in that meeting, I remember Tony saying like something along the lines of like, not good enough. it's not good enough. And I, I remember I like left that meeting and I just went for a long walk where I just cried my eyes out. Because you didn't because feel seen. I didn't feel seen and I also felt like I was working so hard for the team. Mm -hmm to be successful and um, and to be fair, they did a good job seeing like selfless things mm -hmm. in that group, but that was one moment where I just felt like a lot. Yeah, I mean, walking in before everything, I was like, if I make it, I'm definitely not gonna play that much. Like I had no expectation at all. And then when I started the game against like our send off game, mm -hmm. when else, yeah. I was like in the starting group a lot and I was, doing that a lot I was like okay maybe this is might be my role or if I That's keep so doing well crazy. that I, this this is how it's gonna go yeah um You're like, and then I'm gonna when, start every game <laughs> maybe I don't know I was just I I don't know I didn't know yeah. so I was like just preparing myself for that and then like once we came went to Auckland like I feel like I wasn't performing as well as I could have. You just, didn't feel like yourself. Yeah, yeah, I felt like yeah. I feel like I was in my head a lot after like my first mistake. Or okay. like mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, I'm so bad. Like I was I had a lot of negative talk, I think, in my head and I wasn't I just felt like I wasn't doing as well as I should be doing. So then it all like mm -hmm. fell after now you're like so at a World Cup and now you're you're like, Am I gonna be starting a World Cup? Like yeah. that's really a lot that's a lot for an 18 year old a lot for an 18 year old that's just starting on the Nash team so I think you should give grace with yourself that like all of those feelings that you were feeling are like actually totally normal um and that's like kind of the grace that you should have when you first come in to the national team a couple times I was like I would try to walk into practice and be like okay today is gonna be good and I'm gonna be okay <laughs> So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> gonna do something amazing. Yeah, today. <laughs> I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to do what I'm good at, cause like that's why I'm here. And then one practice, I was like, okay, like I played how I usually play, okay. and I was like happy with myself. <laughs> and after that practice, that's when I was just like, okay, I I'm doing good now, and I'm happy. And like a lot of like my teammates, like the younger girls, they like saw that I was like upset, and they helped me a lot because they've oh, been in great. like my position before, like being young on the team and mm -hmm. coming up and knowing that you could be hard on yourself a lot. So yeah, they helped a lot for sure. That's awesome to hear because I think that's a big part of the the kind of group dynamic. So I'm really happy to hear that like you kind of found your your group there. What's next for Alyssa Thompson? Like, what's next? yeah, what's next? I'm looking forward to finishing out the season with Angel City. I hope we can win our next games and make it to the playoffs. <laughs> That's what I hope we can do. <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to that. And I hope that I can make the Olympic team. But that, I feel like that's so far away, but it's not. No. Mm -hmm. It's right around the corner. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. I'm thinking Strap about... It. Yeah, yeah, get ready. <laughs> I'm thinking about the now, so... Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, you, have a, you have a good way about being present. Yeah. You're going to enjoy the LA, rest of the LA summer. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy the rest of the LA summer, and I'm going to finish out the season with Angel City, and I really hope we make it to the playoffs. We're going to. Great. Manifest yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and all of your friends and your boyfriend are leaving for college. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about that? <sighs> um, sad. 
I've been hanging out with them a lot because um, they leave soon, but they'll come back for Thanksgiving okay. and winter break <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't want to think about it. Oh, no. Yeah. Tears on the show. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and, and one last uh, question that I now forgot. Oh, I because have Because I was thinking about long distance relationships. <laughs> 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 Oh no. Okay, I have one. Okay, I have one good one. Oh, yeah. Um, and I actually was thinking about this when uh, Tom was telling the story that we heard about you like putting your um, your oh, face on. Your face is on because of eyes face. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to hear uh, from your perspective like what the national team has meant to you. Like growing up, um, obviously, you watched the team win two World Cups. You dreamed about being there. Now you're like the young part of the team. You're the future of the team. Like, what does the U.S. Women's National Team mean to you and mean to your family? Well, it means a lot, honestly, because I have always looked up, like, to you guys, obviously, <laughs> and the team, and it's always been a dream. Like, I feel like when you think about soccer in the U.S., you think about the national team, and you think about mm -hmm. just, like, the best players in the world. And I wanted to be a part of that group for so long. And me and my sister, like, dream about it and dreamed about it um, for such a long time. Like, once we, once I got called into, like, my first youth national team camp. You put on that first yeah. press. <laughs> you remember that, right? I do. Yeah. I, like, I was 12, and I was like, this is real. Like, I could go further than this yeah. and I would like in the moment I don't think it clicked for me that this is what can lead you to be on the full national team but once I like started going through like the ages and continuing I was like wow and watching you guys like you guys are so inspiring like for so many people and like just being able to be a part of that and inspiring young girls to play soccer and like be like a fan like me like when I was when I was a, like I'm, I feel I'm still a little you're like girl. last year <laughs> you're not a little girl I still feel like you're a little magician you're a little magician <laughs> <laughs> you're a little magician <laughs> whatever I still feel like it's the coolest thing in the world. So yeah, um, it's awesome. yeah, it means a lot to me, really. Well, I love I love to hear that because um, I feel like every player that comes through this program has this like shared experience of like the re the moment that you one realize what the team means, which is greatness, mm -hmm. and it's also progress and equity and. Um, so many of the things that we just like strive for. And then you have this other moment where you realize like you're good enough to yeah. maybe make it. Yeah. And that's like such an inflection point in all of our life. Um, and like they might come at different times. Like apparently yours came when you were 12. Mine came when I was 24. <laughs> <laughs> but we got there, you know, uh, one way or wow. another. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it's really beautiful. We're so excited to cheer for you and watch. And play with you. And play too. with you. And so um, watch your, your journey unfold because I think it's going to be really, really special. Thank you. And thanks for coming on the recap show. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. <laughs> okay, um, we are joined by Shauna Palmer from Football for Her. She's doing some incredible things um, in her community, and we're really excited to have her on so that we can amplify her work um, and hear about all that she's doing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank thanks for you. having me. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited. <laughs> and I just want to preface that everybody was asking about Ali Riley's t-shirt on the last episode. Yes. Do you want to uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? Yes, they're actually all sold out. So thank you, Ali. Oh, yeah, we do have some hoodies left, which... Get um, your hoodies. Yes, get your hoodies, footballforher.org. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we did a partnership with Carlene Jackson, which is a human rights sports artist from Canada. Um, she's incredible, so go look her up and we created an art piece that encompasses 54 different objects um, about World Cup history, the past, the present, and the future. So if you really guys... Really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Really cool. All of our uh, viewers, just tell us a little bit about football for her and the work that you do. 
Yeah, so football for her is a safe and inclusive space for those who identify as female or non-binary to come and play, and we provide mentorship and resources and partners with Angel City, so we have all you cool people coming on, um, and just providing a positive atmosphere for and, the kids in LA. And what inspired you to start this organization? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have any female-specific soccer players to idolize when I was growing up. Obviously, I had an amazing family with an amazing mom and two amazing sisters that obviously I got introduced <laughs> to the sport because, you know, they were playing, so I played, but I never had somebody to look up to that was on that next level, you know? Yeah. And even through all of that, I got on youth national teams and had no idea what that even meant. I was like this little naive <laughs> kid, I'm not even kidding, that was like, can't wait to see my friend from Texas play for a week, you know, just, which is, something's beautiful about that because I feel like there's so much pressure mm -hmm. nowadays mm -hmm. within totally. the club system and organized sports that I talk about it like, oh my gosh, what I was, what was I thinking or not thinking about when I was that kid? But I feel like that's something that's really lacking in today, just that joy yep. um, of yep. playing. I'm yeah. so passionate about creating unorganized <laughs> spaces, uh -huh. especially for girls. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're so structured, we need to be told like what to do and how to do it in yeah. order to do it, as opposed to just exactly. play and creating mm -hmm. a safe space mm -hmm. to just kind of explore, like explore the possibilities mm -hmm. of what you can do with a ball. Yeah, um, we I'm actually, passionate about we that. always talk about it because it's like it was a misfortune to not have professional league prof to watch, right? But it kind of created a presence where like what you wanted, what I wanted as a kid was to be the best kid on that field that day. Mm -hmm. And now what you're like talking about is like the pressure and the expectation of like the structure that exists now, it's, um, it's a lot for people to manage. So how do you create an environment for um, the people that in the community that you're serving that allows them to have that joy um, and freedom when they're playing? Yeah, I mean, going off of what you said, I feel like we just have this space where you can come and not have that pressure and just express yourself. Mm -hmm. And our organization, we're not here to build all professional athletes, mm -hmm. right? It's you can use this space to come and a lot of kids do to make friends and this is the only time they socialize, right? Mm -hmm. Or some are so excited about Angel City, which all of them are excited about Angel City. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they like scream like crazy every time <laughs> anybody is there. We had people actually from like the back end that helps us with like the operation side that come and they're asking for their pictures Aww, and all of that. So cute. they just love the organization. So obviously they're doing an amazing job mm -hmm. with creating that culture here in LA, which has been lacking obviously for so long. Yeah, the community aspect I think is is crucial to this culture that we're trying to build around football where it's not just about performance, it's not just being a professional, it's about really loving the sport, lo really loving what is additive about the sport, mm -hmm. like friendship, community, um, kind of growing up, life lessons, all of these things mm -hmm. that we kind of applaud play. football for, the act of play. Just being yeah. kids again. You know, being <laughs> kids. Is this something that you want to expand or are you really focusing on kind of like continuing to dig dig deep in the, in the LA roots? Is What's kind of your overall goal and objective? Yeah, I mean, right now, obviously hit LA hard. Obviously LA is a large space yeah. and <laughs> There aren't a lot of pitches available. Yeah. Um, one. Oh no. I, there yeah. Not. There's not at all. It's yeah. so crazy. I before running football for her full time, I had my tr private training business. So mm -hmm. getting kicked off of fields yeah. and was a whole thing. Or you had to pay for the fields, which was more than what I was making for that hour. So it made no sense. So we were hopping fences and doing all this. So one, just you know, it's good that we're just providing a space, mm -hmm. right? Like I said, they can come. Do whatever they want here um but yeah it's difficult to even find fields in la yeah is this something that is an add-on to like for for any kid that's kind of looking for for this type of experience or opportunity what is what is that kind of like add-on to their life does does this replace a club environment does this replace an after-school activity like how does it play out in their lives yeah so with our community that comes we have a broad um, audience. So we have literally kids from the neighborhood that this is the only place that they actually play the sport. That's awesome. We have kids that do play in organized teams but come and enjoy their, I call it the FFH fam, our football for her family every mm -hmm. Friday night. You know, So we get an array of individuals which is also difficult to maintain as an organization to try to keep it fun yeah. and active and competitive in their own ways for everybody which is what you know we're still continuing to work on, you know, every day or every year and every month trying to look back and get feedback and, mm -hmm. you know, what are people's needs and 
some of people's needs aren't they don't align with our goals you know mm -hmm. and we've got that of like it needs to be more intense it needs to be you know i'm like well we're not trying to slide tackle and two foot people <laughs> um so maybe this isn't the space for you and that's okay and we're totally fine with that right yeah. so if they don't align with what our mission is and what we're trying to do here and we have this thing every single time we're like you know we say our names we say our pronouns and no bullying awesome. yeah. right no bullying um which is the biggest aspect of creating a safe space is yeah. making sure that they know they can come here and you know it's not going to be any negative from anybody oh i love that yeah. i love like creating the structure so that there's like freedom and safety in there i think that's mm -hmm. so important obviously we were so proud uh with re partnering with football for her for our written in the stars collection uh because the work that you're doing is so important and i think i'm i'm very passionate about how uh football in this country has a, like a financial barrier um, mm -hmm. and a pay to play structure. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that you're like opening doors and making it more inclusive is is deeply meaningful. Um, I think that it is it, it incredibly important for for our country to allow football to play the role that it plays all over the world where, mm -hmm. where, where it's just freedom and playfulness and safety. Um, so for our entire audience, would love uh, you to share how people can get involved, how people can support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously if you're in the LA area and you are close to the Pacoima or Gardena Lab 5 location, you guys can come and participate. Um, if you can't make it, if you can just share our information, um, you can get everything on football for her. Dot org. Obviously, if there's anybody out there who would like to support in other ways, financially, or have an event, or whatever that may be, again, footballforher.org has everything, and you can email me specifically, Shauna, at footballforher.org. I love the aspect of creating um, spaces, mm -hmm. especially spaces for girls around sports. Mm -hmm. I know as when I was young and, you know, I loved playing pickup, I, I would play football with anyone, but I was, I was excluded from those spaces. Uh, and I also had a hard time. I knew that I had to come in and I had to like prove that I had to be there. But mm -hmm. all the guys that showed up, they didn't have to prove they had to be there. Yeah, they no. just were guys. They just yeah. showed up and played. But I had to do something or be something extra to even belong there. To even get the ball. To even get the ball, <laughs> yeah. And, true. and yeah, like that, that it's like did. like 10 minutes in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, and, and did that help my development? Of course. But it's like do more like but it spaces weeded out need a lot of be, women. Yeah, yeah it weeds yeah, out, totally. like, believe me, like, Very it intimidating. weeded out a lot. To think that, for me, it, my ability level could think, oh, can I be here in this mm -hmm. space is crazy. Think yeah. about all of the players that were lost because it is a really intimidating environment, so I love the idea of creating spaces for girls around sports, particularly around football, something that has been instrumental to us all. And like you said, you're doing something that's first- there's nothing else like that in the U.S., which is just so crazy. In the U.S., astonishing. Which, like obviously, I do my research, you know, and yeah. I didn't find anything like it. Um, and then, like I told you, a partner was like, "Yeah, you're the only organization actually in the United States." Wow. And I'm like, "Cool," but then I was like, "This is not cool. It's yeah. actually not good yeah. that I'm the only organization, and I don't want to be the or only organization, yeah. you know, for yeah. obviously the better of the development and the youth and." the sanity, honestly, of kids yeah. these days is yeah. having more spaces like this where they can come and just be free, Fun. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love what you're doing. We love supporting it. Um, and for everyone else that's hearing about you and your organization for the first time, I hope they get involved as well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thanks Thank for you. having Yay. me. I'm so excited. <laughs> as you all know by now, we like to finish each episode by looking forward to the next matchup. And wow we have the World Cup Final. And anyone would be crazy to try to predict this one. With that being said, I predict Spain 2, England 1. Let's see if I'm right on the final episode of the recap show, World Cup Edition. 